This is a quick walkthrough of how to use Google Apps Script to enrich document content using the DuckDuckGo API. If you don't know that API, DuckDuckGo is a, a nice search engine. It's very fast and it's got a very simple to use API. So first look at the result. Here's a document with some random stuff about Oscar winners copied from Wikipedia. So let's say I want to add content about selected items in here to various places in the document. So first I'm going to select the text that I want to enrich. So Toy Story 3. Next I get the abstract from DuckDuckGo about Toy Story 3. Then I go somewhere in the document and then I insert the abstract that I just got. Now look what just happened. We got some stuff using the DuckDuckGo API, an image nicely formatted and a little story about that. Let's try it with something, some other thing. Let's take uh, I don't know, The Last Emperor. Get abstract. Go somewhere. Insert it. There you have it. So very simple to use and, and very effective. So let's see how that works. I've written this as a custom menu addition for a container document. In real life, you might want to make something like this into an add-on. First of all, here's how to add the items to the menu. I have two items under my abstracts menu. One that gets the abstract using the currently selected text and another that adds that abstract into the current cursor position. Now let's look at the code to do that. There are three steps to the entry to do with getting the abstract. The first is to get the selected text, in other words, the, the active selection. The next is to do the query using that selected text. And the third is to copy that result to cache so that when we use the insert abstract menu entry, it will go off to cache, get that, and write it in. So we'll look at each of those in a little bit more detail. First step is to get the currently selected text. Well, this is fairly standard stuff. Getting a selection works like this. Now, in a Google document, a selection is actually a range. And the range consists of what's called range elements. Range elements are what defines the particular elements, paragraphs, or whatever, that go together to make up an, a, a complete range. Now, a range element can refer to an entire element, or it can refer to just part of an element. So in this example, we're going through each one of the range elements belonging to the selection. And then we're going to select out, we'll look at this function in a moment, the text that's in that element. And it may well be it's the entire thing, but it may also be just a partial element, in which case we need to take just a piece of the text belonging to that element. So let's look at that function. We're passing the properties of the range element to it. So we have to do a little bit of a try-catch here because, of course, not elements can be can be cast as text. For example, if I pass over, a, if the range that's been selected happens to contain an image or something, there won't be any text with it. So we have to take care of that. But in, in principle, what's going to happen is that if this is a partial element, then we're going to copy out a piece of the text. Otherwise, we're going to return the entire text belonging to that element. So at the end of all of that, we'll have gone through every one of the pieces of the selection. We'll have selected out the pieces of text that were associated with it, and we'll return it. And that together will give us our query. So back in our document, if the selection was Toy Story 3, then that's what we'll have. So the next step is to go off to the duck.go API, passing the selected text to it. So let's go and check that out. Just before we do, we've got a few settings here. First is the endpoint for the duck.go API. And then the rest of the stuff is just various parameters that we're going to use. Um, we're using two different caches. We're using the document cache, which is going to hold the result that's returned from the 
menu entry about get abstract and then we're going to use the script cache which is going to be remembering any queries about any particular thing so that anybody who uses this script will be able to share previous results so when you're using cache it's always a good idea to allow it to be not used so in this case I'm allowing an optional parameter that says whether or not to use cache so the format of the query the query URL to the DuckDuckGo API is very straightforward it's just the text that you want to look for and remind it that you'd like the result to be in JSON so if this query has been done recently then we'll find it in cache already so we don't have to go off and redo the query so if that worked okay we're going to get some result back from the API we're going to convert it into an object and one of the things that you get back from this API is a URL to an image which we want to insert in the document it needs a little bit of tidying up so we have to go off again to the web this time to get the image that's associated with that URL so we'll take a look at what this function does here it is so it simply takes a URL does another fetch app dot fetch using that URL and this time instead of returning the text that's associated with the response it now returns the response as a blob which is how an image can be dealt with inside docs so now when we're back here we've got the image as a blob we want to store this image in cache so that the next time that it's called if it's called in a fairly short time then we will already have that image available and we won't have to go and get it again um, however in cache you can only store string values so we can use base64 in code to change the contents of a blob into text so we can then store that in cache so this is what's going to go back to the calling function it's stuff that I've extracted from the API response plus the image that we've just calculated of course like all things app script there are various limits to worry about um, in this particular case you can only write up to 100k to cache so if what I'm about to write to cache is too big I have to do something about it so what I'm going to do is to not write the image not write the character version of the image so if it does happen to find this in cache the next time then it will know it has to go off and get the image again and then finally we write whatever we have to cache ready for the next time so there's a lot of stuff about caching things here and the reason for that is that with app script there are plenty of quotas and limitations to worry about one of them would be for example URL fetch the number of times you can do that in a day or the number of times you can do that per second so by writing things to cache you can avoid some of these potential pitfalls and it's always best to bring them in to write that in from the start in this particular application it's probably not that not that important but get into the habit of using cache and you'll avoid mistakes down the line and you can see the result here because if it did find it in cache instead of doing all those things that we just looked at we just have to do this copy and paste function is not available within with an app script so we have to somehow emulate that so what we're doing is we're just going to copy the final result to a different cache the insert abstract what we're about to look at in a moment will look in that separate cache for any results that are there lately and that's what it will insert in the document so let's see what that does very straightforward just puts the value there so now we can go ahead and look at the opposite of that now what happens when you select the menu to insert something insert the abstract what does it do so the first thing it does is it goes off to get that cached result and if there was one then it has to create an image because if you recall we changed the image from a blob to some text and now we have to convert it back again and then finally we insert the text and the image at the current position in the document 
So let's look at, look at that in some detail, starting with paste. So paste, very simple, just takes the last thing that was written to cache and returns the result. So let's see how get blob works. Now, if you remember, we had that situation where the image itself may have been too big to go in cache, and all we have is the URL. So we have two different routes that we can follow here. The first is that if it wasn't too big, then that means that we already have the image, and all we've got to do is to convert it back from text into a blob using this utilities.new blob. Um, and then that will be the image as a blob, which can then be inserted into the document. However, if the image was too big for cache, then we have to go and get it again. Now we do have the URL, so that's good. We can use the same function that we used previously, get image from URL, and it will go off and get a blob based on that URL. And then finally, we have to insert all that at the current cursor position. So in docs, the cursor is a position class, and we can get the current position by using this get cursor. If there wasn't one, then that means that we're not running it in a in a container document, so therefore we don't have a cursor there, so there's nothing to do. So the target is going to be the element in which the cursor is positioned. And the parent is going to be the parent of that element. So the reason we need that is because we're going to insert some new elements that are going to be siblings of the target element. So we use the, the joint parent to to with the insert paragraph method. Now that takes a, a, a strange argument, which is the child index of the target. This is saying get the position within the parent, the, the target element, in other words, where the cursor was. So let's say that the parent was the document body, and let's say that the target was the fifth paragraph. And what this is saying is before the fifth paragraph, insert a new one. And the thing to insert is the query text. So to get back to our document, the first thing that was inserted was the was the query Toy Story 3. And in Google Docs, the heading level is the formatting option that you choose. So this is going to be whatever we've set to be the heading level for these types of things, which we can go back and look at in a moment. So we've decided these are going to be heading th heading threes. Now next we want to insert an image. So if there was one, we have to go through the same thing as we did with the paragraph using getting the child index again, uh, inserting the image and then putting the blob in that was returned from cache. Or at least it was returned having been converted from cache. And then we don't want these images to be all different sizes. So if we go back to the document, we can see that this image is the same size as that one, although they probably didn't start that way. So we'll see what this function now does. So given a particular width, I want to scale the size of the image proportionately. In other words, I want to change the width the same amount, as I, same proportion as I change the width. So I'm just doing that by calculating the the changes that's needed in the height. And then I return the, the inline image, which is now set to a different size than it was when it first arrived. So let's see what the settings are that we've decided all we want our images to be. So here we are, the setting is 100, 100 pixels. We could make that some different value if we wanted. And then finally, the same procedure as before. This time we want to insert another paragraph with the abstract text. So a document, that's this stuff. And that's it, that's all there is to it. So let's get another one. There we have it. So the cloud-based nature of AppScript allows you to do all sorts of cool things pretty straightforwardly using all kinds of APIs that are out there. If you want, the code for this example, the URL is on the screen, or you can buy my new book, Going Gas, which is available at O'Reilly, Amazon, and all good booksellers.